good afternoon everyone thank you for coming along today for this afternoon uh, to our urban futures graduate research symposium and particularly this session on transition to a low carbon housing future um, before we start would like to acknowledge the the tradition owners of the land RMIT University acknowledges the people of the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation on, the, on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. RMIT University respectfully acknowledges their ancestors and elders, past and present. Uh, we also acknowledge the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia where we conduct our business. So thank you once again for coming along today. So we have um, a session on transition to a low carbon housing future. So before that, I would quickly want to introduce about a new center we are, we, we are in the process of launching. And the session, the, the, this session will showcase the work of this uh, center and the directions of the new post carbon center for infrastructure and built environment. So the vision of the center is to bring together um, research capability within RMIT across the built environment and um, combining expertise from the design, architecture, construction, engineering, um, computer and geospatial science and the social sciences. So the center will address the complex challenges of decarbonizing the built environment and infrastructure, and uh, basically to transform to a sustainable, equitable and resilient future through three research themes, which is transition, design and production. So transition talks about the institution policy society context um, and how uh, the workforce skill sets and employment around the construction and decarbonization is actually working together. And um, the design, it's basically where the RMIT expertise lies and the, the point of differentiation. The post-carbon building design, uh, focusing on regenerative design, circular economy, um, how do we actually monitor and measure buildings, um, information, energy services, and also the embodied carbon. And we also look into actual production and construction and how the, the new technologies like robotics, uh, material 3D printing, um, biomaterials, digitization, uh, digital twins, all of those things will actually provide, um, how do we actually uh, build and actual construct and demonstrate so that we can do things on a large scale. So basically we want to execute a real world application that enable both innovation and impact and stay connected with the uh, social and political context for implementation at large scale. So today's session, uh, we are looking at housing uh, transition. So as we all know, residential building cons consume uh, a quarter of the energy um, in Australia and improving energy efficiency of both new and existing houses is a critical opportunity area for low energy and zero carbon transition. So we have recently completed a project uh, for the Race for 2030 uh, Corporate Research Center uh, on enhancing home thermal efficiency where the priorities and um, opportunities on improving home thermal performance is presented. So thermal efficiency refers to you know how well a building can um, cool make yourself cool um, energy efficient and comfortable during all seasons. So in improving energy efficiency or thermal efficiency in Australian homes, it is important to consider a large range of housing stock across Australia, whether it is detached dwelling, apartment uh, like class two building, and uh, look at all diverse climate zones in Australia, um, and also the markets owner occupied uh, or rented. And also looking into the demography, you know, the, including the most vulnerable people and low socioeconomic uh, population. 
So there are even though considerable research exists about the potential to reduce energy, there has been limited uptake on energy retrofit um, and uh, lack of progress towards wider adoption. So this is indicating a pressing need to overcome significant barriers which probably each of us have experienced in our day-to-day -day, um, living. So while doing energy retrofitting, it is very important to consider indoor environmental quality because that is what basically enhances our comfort, health and well-being. So a comprehensive assessment of energy and indoor environmental performance is fundamental to housing retrofitting process. So this session is going to address the housing retrofit as an approach to transition of a built environment to a post-carbon future. So we will discuss the importance of building performance assessment in the decarbonization journey and the provision of building standards and guidelines. And we will also discuss asset management in the context of social housing, which I have mentioned earlier, the one of the most vulnerable groups, and some of the technologies used in decarbonization. Organization. So today we'll hear from a fantastic um, panel of experts with a wealth of knowledge into in building design standards, building performance assessment, asset management, and real world experience in actual decarbonization. So our first speaker today is Dr. Mary Myla Anderman. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in the school in construction management at the School of Property, Construction and Project Management, and teaches in construction design and building physics. She conducts building and architectural science research in the Sustainable Building Innovation Lab on indoor environmental quality, building pathology, thermal performance, and energy efficiency. Myla will talk about residential building thermal performance requirements. So let's welcome Myla to the stage. Thank you, Priya. Oh, okay. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. So, as have, uh, Priya said, um, I'm Myla. So, um, oh, sorry. So, I'll be covering right, for this symposium. Uh, my contribution will basically be looking at residential building thermal performance requirements. So um, what does it mean to decarbonize? The conversation around decarbonization has become more complex and far-reaching with the global energy crisis and the mounting effects of climate change. Decarbonization has also taken the lead in conversation on the future of the built environment. With the notion that some 80% of the world's energy supply today is somehow carbon-based, there is the imperative that we use just, we, we just need to use less energy. So, but how do we get buildings to use less energy in general? And how do we make buildings more efficient? The Australian Building Codes Board, or ABCB, has, has been directed or was directed in 2019 to develop enhanced residential energy efficiency provisions in the National Construction Code. The NCC is Australia's primary set of technical design and construction provisions for buildings. It is a performance-based code and sets the minimum required level for the safety, health, amenity, accessibility, and sustainability of certain buildings. So essentially, it's a, it's primarily applies, it primarily applies to the design and construction of new buildings. Now, the changes in the NCC provisions include the minimum level of thermal performance has increased to the equivalent of seven stars um, under the Nationwide Housing Energy Rating Scheme, or the NATHERS. A new en annual energy use budget has been introduced for the first time, uh, which is based on the societal cost of energy. Um, this, this annual energy use budget applies to the heating and cooling equipment, hot water systems, artificial lighting, swimming pool and spa pumps, and uh, on-site renewable energy systems. Now, the NCC changes apply to both houses or class one and the apartments or multi-units, which is class two. It is estimated that there will be around um, 1.8 million new homes or houses and apartments over the life of the regulation. Although Outlook just published by the Housing Industry Association early this month show home building activity to slow for another, for another year with a significant decline in detached home building activity. 
forecasts also show that the influx of investment in high density dwellings will see the volume of commencement of multi-units recover over the next couple of years. So residential buildings are responsible for 7.9% of energy use here in Australia. So 29% are um, for of all electricity use, so all up about 11% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Now with the national approach, um, the NCC 2020 2022 provides, the mix of solutions to improve energy efficiency will be different for each in each climate. So, and you'll vary for different homes within the same climate. So, um, nationally, it's consistent, but fit for all local climate. The energy efficiency provisions in the NCC account for varying climates using the climate zones based on the data from the Bureau of Meteorology. So, for those of you who are familiar with, uh, with the NCC, we, they actually have um, eight climate zones across, across Australia. Now, these zones account for seasonal temperature and humidity changes. The approach also means that the practical solutions available for each home are sensitive to and are sensible for each location. So in terms, for example, of building thermal performance, there could be reduced risk of condensation. So it's actually one of the main things in this um, NCC 2022 provisions. Now, the societal cost of energy, um, which is the basis for the energy use budget introduced in NCC 2022, is defined as the total cost of greenhouse gas emissions and the time of use impact on the energy network, which is comprised of the energy used by a building multiplied by the cost to society for that energy. So um, this NCC provisions or NCC 2022 supports the Australian government's commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 43% by 2030 and achieve net zero emissions by 2050. So um, the easiest market for decarbonization consideration is new construction. So being a blank slate with lots of opportunities to really get use energy use intensity down. However, with the retrofits, it would take some careful thinking and, and planning. Now, the stages that influence the performance of a home um, are that the energy efficiency of the building shell or the building fabric could be improved to reduce the amount of energy needed to keep that home at a comfortable temperature. Um, this would be a building fabric would mean the external walls, the, the floor, the roof, the external glazing, the shading and the ceiling of the building itself. Now, the energy efficiency of fixed heating and cooling appliances could also be improved to reduce the amount of energy being used to keep the home at a comfortable temperature. Further, the renewable energy or photovoltaic or solar panels could be used to generate energy on site. Now, reducing the amount of energy being drawn from the grid and reducing energy bills, partly by offsetting electricity use and partly from income earned from exporting that electricity. So there are two compliance options, just as an overview of the building code. There are two new performance requirements in the NCC 2022. So first is the thermal performance, and the second one is the annual energy use budget. For the thermal performance, the increase of the equivalent of NATHER 7 stars is projected or anticipated to deliver a significant improvement in thermal comfort for occupants. Some of the improvements are, so more options of, of roof, floor, and floor insulation. Um, addressing thermal bridging, which would reduce heat loss and gain through the roof, the building fabric essentially, so walls and floors. Lighter color roofs and external walls in warmer climates would reduce heat gain within the building. New ceiling fan requirements for warmer climates for e efficient and effective cooling. And window requirements are would be more appropriate for climate. So there would also be lower heating and cooling demand. For the annual energy use budget, which is another compliance option, um, this provides a flexible approach to encourage the selection of more efficient equipment, which is the major contributor to the household energy use. So some improvements um, that the provisions um, see would be more energy efficient air conditioners for heating and cooling, more energy efficient instantaneous gas and electric heat pump for water heaters. Now bear in mind that um, when the development of the NCC provisions was was between 2019 and 2022, and then um, there's now more push in terms of electrification in, in new builds, particularly with um, class one and class two. The total energy use uh, for this um, by these appliances minus any, gener ener any energy generated on site must be less than or equal to the an annual energy use budget. The annual energy use budget for apartments is around 40% higher 
or a bit more lenient than the budget for the houses. So this is to account for the practical challenges of installing rooftop, rooftop, rooftop PV, PV panels on, on apartments. Now, with the push to electrific electrification, we have good heat pump technologies available, and Carl will be will be talking about that um, later on in the symposium. Now, with the reduction in building loads due, due to optimal building fabric thermal performance, um, ground uh, heat pumps would make a lot of sense to heat and cool the building. So, better building envelopes and testing them also helps heat pump implementation. Now, some practical improvements. Um, uh, from the new provisions would include more comfortable homes, uh, better air movement, particularly in warmer climates, um, better insulation, more energy efficient appliances, light col lighter colored roofs, um, particularly for warmer climates, and more rooftop solar. Now, these provisions um, were informed, the provisions in the NCC 2022 were informed by the trajectory for low energy buildings policy in 2018. Now, these are some of the recommendations, so such as climate specific energy uh, usage budget should be quantified as a performance requirement, which is now actually a compliance option in the NCC 2022. Now, um, the NCC 2022 should also include provisions that recall buildings to be ready to accommodate on-site renewables, so PV panels um, in a sense. Now, energy efficiency provisions should, also, should be substantially updated in 2022 and 2025, and then revert, revert to the um, triennial revisions just to ensure that provisions are in keeping with the changing technologies. Um, as Priyas mentioned, the NCC 2022 should also consider changes to the ceiling of the building. So um, the air tightness and then the ventilation, the lighting and the splitting the heating and the cooling load limits whilst ensuring that there are no adverse impacts on the condensation and inner air quality. Now, NCC 2022 was, was adopted by the states and territories in the, on, May, on in 1st of May this year. But um, Victoria has sort of extended, um, no, not sort of, has extended the transition, transitional arrangements for the following provisions. Um, the livable housing requirements, as well as the updated energy efficiency and condensation mitigation requirements until 1st of May 2024. Um, I guess it was basically agreed that this would provide uh, builders um, more time to actually um, prepare and then incur uh, while encouraging the transition of voluntary compliance um, with the standards. So, um, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Myla. I think you will have an opportunity to ask questions after the end of all the presentations. Thank you very much. Um, so, the next speaker uh, is Felipe. Felipe Jara Besa is a Chilean architect with postgraduate degrees in sustainable development and sustainable design and high performance building from University of Sydney. He has working experience as a sustainability consultant focusing on energy efficiency and sustainable rating systems in architectural practices and as a project director of a sustainable construction program in Chile. Currently, he is in the final stage of completing his PhD at RMIT University, assessing holistically the indoor environmental quality of high-rise social housing, focusing on the impact of different window typologies. Felipe will talk about social housing performance assessment. Let's welcome Felipe for his talk. Thanks, Priya. Um, so, yeah, my name is Felipe. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce you to my research topic, uh, which is uh, in environmental quality in high rise social housing in Melbourne. Uh, my supervision team is Professor Priya Rajakumbalan, Dr. Mary Maila Andamon, and external supervisor, Professor Richard Dedier. So I'm going to first talk about a little bit about the research topic, so the problem statement and the context of this research, then a theoretical framework, so how different IQ, IQ in the environmental quality domains has been defined, then the theory of motivation, one of the theories that I'm using, and then I'm going to show you a diagram with the theoretical framework, also a research framework with the methods of uh, data collection, uh, and I'm going to show you at the end some key findings 
of uh, resonance perceptions so of subjective analysis and also field monitoring, which is the objective part. So the problem is that low-income families usually has higher health-related issues, which could be even worse uh, because of the building elements and characteristics. So they have poor indoor environmental quality affecting them, um, uh, affecting their health. And social housing usually rely on passive system, system although in Victoria they have a subsidized heating in the high-rise buildings. And the specific focus of my research is um, on windows, so how windows affect in the environmental quality in those buildings. And studies have, are usually focusing on a single factor, not an in holistic way. And there is limited information in the local context and even less in an holistic assessment. So this is the inner Melbourne area. And I have picked the buildings uh, the, um, built by the Housing Commission in the 60s. So of most of the high-rise buildings that you see, like Richmond, Collingwood, Flemington. So those are uh, 16 landlords with 38 different buildings. So some of them has like four or five buildings, and other ones may have just one building. So this is just one close-up of a Carlton Zone. So there's four different type of four different buildings, three types. So the S-shaped building, the Y-shaped building, and the T-shaped building. So that happens in the different landlords, different type of buildings, but they have been constructed in the same way. So they have, even if they have different shapes, they have been constructed with um, lightweight precast concrete. They have sim similar layouts. So that's the reason why I have, I have picked this cohort of uh, people and buildings because there's a bigger population and all of them kind of share similar characteristics. So um, in terms of theoretical framework, uh, so road has defined well-being as an holistic part of IEQ assessment, but the issue is that well-being is many times used interchangeable between comfort and health or many times as a synonym, but they have kind of separated them into three domains. So comfort, health, and well-being as a separate domain. So the they have come with this definition. In the con so comfort is in the conditions related to occupant satisfaction and annoyance avoidance based on preference and the given activity performed. So it's related with the physical and psychological dimensions. Then health is attributed to the indoor conditions, which contribute to physical resilience, limiting conditions of the, leading to infirmity, disease, and years of life lost. So physical and also physiological dimensions. And then well-being is associated with indoor environmental conditions, which improve occupants' happiness through the presence of positive stimuli, providing control and offering variations. So which is really linked to the psychological dimension. So the, one of the theories I'm using is the theory of needs, the hierarchy of needs or the theory of motivation from Maslow. So he's stating that, that in order to achieve fulfillment, you need to first address the basic needs. So I have highlighted here the ones that are linked to indoor environmental performance. So we have first the, physio uh, the physiological needs, which is food, shelter, water, shelter, warmth, and sufficient sleep, then the safety needs, which is employment, property, health, well-being, and economic security. So all of those, the basic needs. Then I have uh, they have love and belongingness, so friendship, intimacy, sense of connection, self-esteem, respect, recognition, freedom. So those are the psychological needs. And then at the end, self-actualization, which is uh, morality, creativity, meaning, and inner potential. So in order to get to this point, you first need to like fulfill all the basic needs. And that's really linked to IEQ performance. So the framework of my research is first having, the, you're gonna have different variables affecting the indoor conditions. So the different aspects, thermal, daylight, indoor air quality and acoustics, all of those affected in different domains, comfort, health and well-being, And that would lead to the perception of residents decision makings also and behavior. So different theories that would be affecting those would be like cultural backgrounds and adaptations, social practice theory, cognitive bias, and applying the adaptive thermal comfort theory, noise and annoyance. So all of that would lead to satisfaction and importance on IEQ performance. And that would all be linked to the hierarchy of needs so affecting psychological needs or safety needs. So the framework of my research is after defining the different domains for comfort, health, and well-being, that would 
uh, give you different variables that I will be collecting data or I collected data by general surveys affecting subjective part of the performance, then field monitoring to get the objective performance of the apartment units. And that one also linked to a right here, right now questionnaire that residents needs to uh, answer while they are getting the measurements. So that will give you a crossover of uh, performance and perception. And then because I'm gonna try different type of windows, I will do computer simulations to get the different results in terms of the different uh, factors. So thermal, daylight, IQ, and acoustic. Uh, and that would lead you to a general performance or overall IQ performance. Some of the results so far from the general survey, so 94 participants on those ones, 54% uh, of the people is actually satisfied with the indoor environmental quality of their apartment units. Uh, the highest one, the highest satisfaction is uh, daylight. So 72% of the people is satisfied with that. There is high satisfaction also with temperature in winter, but there is a poor a dissatisfaction, 33% of them, with temperature in summer. So they feel that the apartment units are really overheated and in summer and, and not issue in winter because they have subsidized heating. In terms of importance, they think that uh, the one of the ones the ones with highest importance is temperature. So there is some studies saying that when you have a poor performing factor, that would have higher importance. Uh, so they are least satisfied with the temperature in summer. It makes sense that they have um, rating uh, temperature as the highest importance, but there is not a, a lot of correlation here because uh, they have um, addressed daylight as one of the highest in terms of satisfaction, but also one of the highest in terms of uh, um, importance. In the acoustic aspect, uh, so from people that have experienced noise, 61% thinks that the main issue is that they are not able to sleep, but also 43% thinks that the problem is that they cannot open the windows for ventilation. So this is in line with other studies showing that no opening the windows is one of the most relevant aspects or problems related with noise. And they have also addressed uh, um, mentioned that noise, um, the difference between noise when windows are open and closed is actually statistically significant. So that give us a, a, an idea of the relevance of windows and how they are performing in terms of noise reduction when they are closed. So I found also uh, correlations between the different uh, IEQ aspects with the health, uh, building health related issues symptoms. So the one that highest, has highest correlations is air quality, then followed by noise when the windows are closed, view satisfaction, extreme cold day sensation, mold experience, and also daylight in the kitchen, which is the darkest place in the, in the units. Now for the field monitoring, uh, we can see that in summer, there, there is a lot of uh, times that the temperature a lot of times that the temperature is actually reaching highest temperatures, um, around 30 degrees or more, 32.5 in some cases. If we break down this one in groups and the percentage of time that they are in different, uh, the different uh, ranges, we can see that some of them are 83% or 78% of the times above 26 degrees, which would not be an issue if we consider the um, adaptive comfort model because they are still in a range of comfort. But the issue is that they have, rec the, the measurements have recorded that the airspeed is less, most of the time less than 0 0.2 meters per second, which means that um, on the thermal comfort model, um, when, the, when the air movement is so low, 26 per, uh, degrees is the, is the limit. Like above that, all people will feel, most of the people will feel un uncomfortable. So, analyze a bit. Um, so, um, when the units are more than 26 degrees inside, when they are overheated, I found that a big percentage of the time, the outdoor temperature is actually below 26. So it's like the, the units are overheated, but the outdoor temperature is fine. Many times, as you can see here, even getting to 10 or 15 degrees. So your unit is 26, at the outdoor conditions are 10, 15 degrees. So there is a potential there about ventilation or improving the, 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 the ventilation rate so people can reduce the, the overheating uh, inside the units. Uh, and that's actually, uh, sorry, that's, oh, how can I go back? Oh, 
<laughs> sorry. Ah, uh, this one, sorry. Uh, so that's actually 70% 70, 70 of the time they were under 26 outside and only 30% were above 26. So um, the difference between the temperature when they are overheated is actually statistically significant between them. Uh, and you may think that the issue is that probably it was a hot day and then during the night the outdoor temperature dropped and then that's the reason why you have the difference. But actually 36% of the time the outdoor temperature, when the outdoor temperature was lower than 26 degrees and the units were overheated, were actually during daytime. Only 34% were during night times. So that gives me an idea of how important windows could be in order to improve the indoor conditions on those apartment units and to reduce energy consumption and other associated issues that could lead to a healthier life for those vulnerable people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felipe. I think um, Felipe is focusing on windows, which probably is the most, one of the most difficult thing to retrofit in apartments. Um, but uh, th thank you again. And um, the next speaker we have is Andrea, Dr. Andrea Sharam. is a senior lecturer in the School of Property Construction and Project Management. Uh, at RMIT University, and uh, she specializes in research on social and affordable housing, housing affordability, nonprofit property, and apartment development. Following up on an AHURI-funded research project, so AHURI stands for Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute, a project to develop a social housing asset management framework. Andrea has led Australian and New Zealand academic and industry collaboration to develop a specialized specialist asset management for social housing manual. The manual has won three industry awards for excellence. So today, Andrea will talk about asset management in social housing. Thank you, Priya. All right, not pressing the right one, am I? That one? No? No. This one, this one Have we got... Okay, it's all happening now. Thank you. So, the social housing sector in Australia is valued, so the housing itself is valued at around $105 billion. So that's a lot of investment in assets. Oh. Why doesn't that work? Slowly. Slowly. Okay, I have to go slow. <laughs> Okay, it only comprises about 4.5% of housing stock nationally, but that's still a lot of houses. Uh, okay, I think it has to. Anyway, so most of this stock is actually quite old. Most of the stock was built before 1970, much of it many decades before that. So it's highly depreciated. It's often very um, lacking in functionality. It's certainly often lacking in sustainability, particularly energy efficiency. And there's a uh, huge need of upgrading, if not renewable, renewing. Just doesn't seem to go whichever way. Very quick. Okay. So the people who live in public housing have a high burden of disease and ill health. And this is really significant when we want to talk about retrofitting because this is a population that's extremely vulnerable to heat. Um, and we are going to see increasing numbers of days with extreme heat. It's also a system where it delivers the affordability for tenants through income-based rents, meaning they pay 25% of their household income in rent. That does not provide the revenue 
to social housing providers to do anything more than cover operating expenses. So all the capital needs of these organisations comes through ad hoc government grant programs. And they're very ad hoc. Usually the money only comes when there's an economic crisis and the government sees the need to stimulate the economy. So that's very, very problematic for thinking about how do we go ahead and retrofit this housing stock. And it should be noted that retrofit programs have been ad hoc and very piecemeal in their own right. And of course, they have always faced a lot of challenges and being rolled out, not, not the least of which is you have to go into tenants' homes and they're often not that cooperative. So what is asset management? It's the management of those physical assets, the housing assets over their life cycle. So that's thinking, that's having a plan, both a strategic plan and an operational plan. A strategic plan that looks to the, from the creation right through to the end of life to asset decommissioning. So that's a plan which could be a hundred years plan because housing, good housing, well-built housing can last a hundred years. Much of it doesn't obviously, but it can. So retrofitting really is about programs that go in the middle into that operational period. And each single dwelling should have its own asset management plan, but it should exist within an overall strategic plan for a portfolio. Now, asset management is a body of knowledge. It's now a highly codified body of knowledge and encapsulated in the ISO 55000. But it exists in terms of scholarly endeavours, it exists at the intersection of many disciplines. So it's typically taught within engineering schools, so it has very engineering bent, you know, that leaves a little bit to be desired because this is property. Um, but even in terms of property, it's, it's non-profit property rather than for-profit property. Uh, sustainability, huge social policy. There's so many angles at which you could start looking at the asset management of social housing. It's a very under-researched area. The research is highly fragmented. It's not conceptually developed and there's not a lot of theoretical development for the field. Corporate real estate is one of the um, theoretical frameworks that has been applied to that strategic management of housing. But it's not, it's a good fit, but not an excellent fit because it's profit maximising and it's just non-profit real estate. Now, most of the research that is occurring is highly specific and often highly technical. So Philip's research is, is an example of that. Absolutely needed, essential, of course. But what we find is that it, it has, hasn't inserted itself into this broader system of knowledge called asset management which would be very useful if it did. And of course, a lot of, there's a lot of research now in social housing that is focusing on sustainability, often not on other aspects of asset management, however. So has that a lack of relationship to, to asset management. So I thought I'd give you a little example about how approaches to asset management can differ and, and the meaning that it could have. So taking the example of hot water services, and I know we're going to talk about heat pumps later, so keeping in theme here. One, one way of looking at asset management is just to replace components as they fail. So in the case of a hot water service, it, it fails. So you ring up the, the maintenance contractor and you, you get them out to replace it once it fails. So let's say it's, you know, 2 a.m. 2 in the morning and the tenant rings up and you have to, you know, someone has to go out there after hours, very costly business. It also embeds a reliance on technology because you're buying ad hoc and you have to buy off the shelf. You can't do that thinking about maybe replacing it with better technology. And because you're um, going through a contract, uh, often the quality of the workmanship is not great because it's everything's kind of just ad hoc and very reactive. But of course, it's a huge disruption for tenants. But you can think about that asset management in a completely different way, about planning ahead. Um, you know you're going to have to replace those hot water services instead of replacing them only once they fail, which yes, maximises the amount of life you get out of it, but it has all these other associated costs. So you could have a planned program, say to replace them 
every nine years, depending on what you've got there. And you could do that on a rolling basis. So it enables you to get economies of scale through bulk purchasing. It allows you to adopt new technology. So you know you're going to replace. If you've got 30,000 housing houses, you know that you can buy 30,000 new heat pumps. So it means you can package those work up for your maintenance contracts, which gives that contractor certainty. And that certainty then means they can train that staff properly means they can do the installations faster, which is obviously cheaper. They can do it with fewer mistakes, which is also cheaper. And of course, less disruption to tenants because you can schedule replacements during the day when it's convenient. So I don't know if anyone here would remember when uh, Elizabeth Shove came to RMIT. Does it? It's a long time ago. I think it was nearly 20 years ago because she's, she's um, a really well-known uh, energy efficiency researcher from the UK and looking at low-income housing in particular. So the thing that she emphasised to us on the day that she was here was about the importance of thinking about systems. So asset management is a system and it's a highly codified system for managing assets. But in terms of thinking about retrofits and how do we get that into social housing, we need to think about social housing as being a delivery system for retrofits. So we might ask the question about how can we um, retrofit asset management as a system in order to deliver retrofits. So this is, I think, a very large research agenda that's possible by looking at asset management as a delivery system. So taking the systems thinking approach, and indeed, I would say a, a systems of systems approach, because there's so many bits that go into the equation. The one thing I could say, you know, anyone who does research in this area will have research impact because it's, it's enormous. The, the benefits for tenants and the benefits for the environment are enormous. So without doubt, there will be great impact. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. It's very, very, I think if anyone wants to do a PhD on system, system thinking in asset management, this is a fantastic opportunity here. All right, so our last but not least speaker is Carl Jensen with the background of aircraft manufacturing quality engineering at Boeing Aero Structures. Carl has a passion for renewables and shares his knowledge and experience with everyone who listen, who will listen. So get him going about renewables, you can't stop him. Um, with over 13 years in the renewables industry, he has amassed a wealth of knowledge around solar PV inverters, panels, and racking systems, distribution network connection requirements, and now thermal and heat pump hot water system. So Carl embraces the transition to renewables and has a modern all-electric 100% self-sufficient home with an electric vehicle that pays back its carbon dioxide footprint. So Carl will talk about heat pump and decarbonization and he will not use a PowerPoint slide today. Thanks. Thank I'm going to make you guys in the audience actually participate and uh, I'll ask for some hands up from time to time. Um, a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, 1921, we burned our first coal in the Latrobe, Latrobe Valley and we started generating electricity. Uh, in the 19, early 1970s, we hooked up to Bass Strait for gas. Uh, by the 1970s, there's a bit of an energy war going on and uh, our electricity providers were offering grants to produce all electric homes instead of ones that uh, by then had natural gas connected. Uh, so in the 70s to the 80s, um, my parents lived in Essendon and I remember there was an oil tank down the side of the house and that's what we used to use for heating in winter. Uh, you guys are all uh, fairly young, probably haven't seen so many of those. They've all been ripped out these days. Uh, so we've developed a, uh, a rather unhealthy obsession with uh, using lots and lots of energy and the more um, luxury that we have in our life, 
the, the more energy that we tend to use. And obviously, if it's inexpensive, we tend to use even more of it. Um, before I came today, I thought I should brush up on my facts and figures and make sure that I was telling you the, uh, the most appropriate information. I read somewhere that we use 9,100 kilowatt hours per person in Australia. Uh, and I also read that uh, if we were to stay under 1.5 degrees of global warming, everybody gets a carbon um, budget of 50,000 kilograms. So if we're using nearly 10,000 kilograms of CO2 a year just in electricity, uh, we're only allowed to be around for five years in history. Uh, that's obviously a problem, uh, and it's one that we're really able to solve. Most recently, we've had a, an increase in our power bills of around 25%. Uh, how that works is all of the energy companies go to the market regulator and say, hey, hang on, it's too expensive for us to produce energy, we need more money. Um, and then the regulator says, yep, I agree, this is the, the new costs, we allow you to go to market at 25% increase in cost of what you had before. Um, this means that everyone's pretty much been bombarded with various energy offers from different retailers. And what that comes down to, it says that the average Victorian household uses 4,000 kilowatt hours of electricity a year. Um, if I divide that by 365, I get 11 kilowatt hours a day. It's not a lot of energy. Does anyone here in the room use 10 kilowatt hours a day? Anyone? One? Got one. That's uh, probably 30 people here. I think that that number is very conservative. Um, if I tick the next box and say that I want to quote for natural gas as well, it says that the average Victorian household uses 50,000 megajoules of gas. Now, the renewable energy industry has never taken any notice of the gas because it's not something we can put panels on your roof to produce. We can't produce gas with a solar panel. So we've ignored people's gas bills. I gave it a little bit of thought and I asked a lot of people in the renewable energy industry, what's the conversion between megajoules of gas and kilowatt hours of electricity? Now, I reckon I've asked that question of a thousand people out of the 9,000 solar in installers that we have in Australia and only one gave me the right answer. So I'll put it to the crowd today. Who knows what the conversion is? Megajoules to kilowatt hours. Got one. Anyone else? Just a hand, little hand? No, don't know what the number is. It's 3.6. So 3.6 megajoules is equivalent to one kilowatt hour. So out of the 50,000 megajoules of gas that that average Victorian household's using, we know that 18,000 megajoules is used to heat water for four people. Uh, and that's 200 litres of hot water a day, 50 litres per person. I also know that out of that 18,000 megajoules of gas in summer, we use less because the inlet water temperature is warmer and in winter, it's a lot colder. So in summertime, it's 20 degrees. In wintertime, it's 10 degrees. So to get it to 40 degrees for me to have a shower, I've got to apply uh, at least 30% more energy to that water to get it to the right temperature. So my 18,000 megajoules, I use more than half of it in four months of winter. So for the sake of argument, um, I'll call it half and be conservative. I need 9,000 megajoules over four months of winter to heat the water. The other 50,000 megajoules using gas for cooking uses fuck all. Um, so I'll take off a couple of thousand megajoules for that. Leaves me 30,000 megajoules of gas that I'm using to heat the person's house over the four months of winter. If it's a little bit longer and I use a little bit less and a little bit and it spills over either side, doesn't really matter. I use 30 megajoules of gas or 30,000 megajoules of gas um, over four months of winter, plus the 10,000 or 9,000 megajoules of gas that I'm using to heat my water and plus uh, half of my uh, allowance for cooking food. Basically, that spins out at 40,000 megajoules of gas that I'm using over a four month period. Uh, so 40,000 divided by 120 divided by 3.6 gives me an incredible 90 something, 95 kilowatt hours a day worth of energy that I'm providing those households in the form of gas. And no one even knows what the conversion is. 
This is a tragedy. So we've got an ability for someone to install a solar system to cover their electrical energy needs. And theoretically, they're only 11 kilowatt hours a day. And then there's this huge elephant in the room. It's another 95 kilowatt hours of energy that I'm applying to that house every day for those people to be comfortable. So it turns out, what do we do? I can't make any gas. I don't have a gas well in my backyard. Turns out I haven't had gas for 12 years. I didn't even know that this was a problem until someone brought it to my attention because I've worked in the solar industry and I haven't been able to make my own gas. So it's made sense that all of my appliances have always been electric. Um, I can put solar panels on my roof. I can generate my own energy. We're still going well short of the mark. Um, has anyone here read the book called The Big Switch or heard of it by Saul Griffith? Anyone? Show of hands. One, two, three, three people. Uh, cost 22 bucks on Amazon. Saul Griffith is a, an Australian engineer, went to the States, had a bit to do with um, helping the Biden administration put together the Inflation Reduction Act. And the theory was that um, we can apply various tax credits to incentivize the uptake of renewable energy. Um, and that would decrease the rate of inflation in the economy because you lower the cost of doing everything. Um, the main easy low hanging fruit, uh, my boss used to say to me, uh, the, the fruit has already fallen off the tree. It's laying on the ground. All we've got to do is pick it up. And that's heat pump technology. So I can take that 95 kilowatt hours a day worth of heat that I'm applying to the, the that house and I can divide that number by 0.75 to get the actual amount of energy that I need. So now I'm in the mid 60s for the amount of energy that I need and then I can apply a heat pump. So I take away gas, I put in a heat pump, it's 400% efficient. So we talked about different kinds of air conditioners and some get slightly higher star ratings than the other. I've done a fair bit of time uh, researching this. It doesn't really matter if it's 400% efficient, 425%, 450% efficient for the sake of argument, readily available stuff on the market today will easily get 400% efficiency. So for the sake of these sorts of discussions, I divide my 70 kilowatt hours a day by four and I end up with less than 20 kilowatt hours worth of electrical energy that I've got to supply that set of heat pumps, but for hot water and space heating in order to provide the same amount of heat as 95 kilowatt hours worth of gas. Now, I couldn't make 95 kilowatt hours worth of energy with my solar system before, but when I put in heat pumps and I need less than 20, I can. I've, I've got enough solar radiation in Victoria to be able to do that. I can add the other 11 kilowatt hours a day that I need to run my TV that I couldn't run on gas before anyway. And I end up with a number around 30 kilowatt hours a day. Now, funnily enough, uh, Saul Griffith spent a year crunching the numbers to end up with uh, 34 kilowatt hours a day for the average Australian household uh, to be all electric, including their electric car. I was lucky enough to get invited to a uh, effectively a piss up on the Murray with Saul Griffith and uh, we spent an evening drinking various forms of alcohol. There weren't many shots involved but there was a fair amount of scotch and, uh, and beer consumed and I said to Saul, I think your numbers for Victoria are pretty light and I'm really struggling to get to 34 kilowatt hours a day in Melbourne in winter and he said, Australia's a big place You've got a whole heap of Queensland that doesn't need any heating at all. You've got New South Wales that basically is in a non-heating climate. They don't need any heating at all either. Perth needs air conditioning. There's a truckload of energy over there to air condition in summer. But Melbourne, it's a problem. And I said to him, why didn't you tell us in the book that Melbourne was a problem? And he says, well, if I tell everyone that they need 50 kilowatt hours a day, they say, get fucked, it's impossible, I can't do it. Um, and no one tries. Um, I worked on a, a fairly simple set of maths for my own house and that was being in the industry long enough, I knew that in order for me to be able to have a zero dollar energy bill, I have to be able to provide enough energy to heat my house in winter. All the other stuff becomes irrelevant. So I either have to buy energy from somebody else and they want to make money 
they want to turn a profit. Uh, they've got a whole heap of infrastructure out there in order to be able to deliver energy to me. So the only way that I can do it by the least possible cost is by putting up enough solar to cover my winter energy demands for an all-electric house. And the number that I came up with was 27 kilowatts of panels on the roof. People say, wow, how did you end up with that number? I say, it's pretty simple. That's what filled up the roof. <laughs> right. And it applies to every house in Victoria. The right size solar system is one that fills up the roof. So amazingly, it's not hard to figure out. It's overcast today. It's overcast 180 days of the year in Melbourne. So some people would call that shit weather. Um, I did speak to some people outside before we started. They come from the UK where it's even shittier. Uh, but in our shit weather, we do still get power out of our solar system. It's terrible, but in June, it's 1.3 kilowatt hours of energy per kilowatt of solar panels you've got installed. In July, it's 1.45. In August, it'll be 1.6, 1.7, maybe even 1.8 on a good day. Uh, but effectively, it doesn't matter which way I face those solar panels in an overcast sky. There's just as much light over there as there is over there. So historically, people have said, oh, South's no good because there's a 30% knockdown in performance over North facing. Yep, sure, I get it. If we average the number out over the course of the year, it's 30%. On an overcast day, it doesn't make a scrap of difference. And unless I've got the roof full solar panels, I can't make enough energy to heat that house. That brings me to the next you know, handful of bits of data for you. I'm a data guy. People tell me that I give people too much information, too much data, and then they don't know what to do with it. So here's that bit. I'm going to give it to you because you are a set of really intelligent people and you might be able to take something away from it. But there's 800,000 hot water services are installed in Australia every year. Is anyone surprised? No, no one's surprised. How many heat pumps do you think we installed for hot water? New builds, 120,000 across Australia, 50,000 in Victoria. Anyone has it a guess? 10,000 heat pumps? Yeah, 20,000, anyone? 50,000, 100,000, anyone? Raising up upwards of 100,000 or below 100,000? Below, yeah, you'd be right, 85,000 heat pumps. So 55,000 of those were installed in Victoria, mostly under the Victorian Energy Upgrades Scheme. A lot of them sadly got terrible reviews because they were undersized, underpowered, not suitable for the people or, or at least not well designed. Um, I've got some fairly seri uh, simple theories here in terms of air conditioners, and there's lots of information out there in the market about right, right sizing air conditioners, so on and so forth. Fortunately, we're in an age now where inverter drive technology is out there. So basically, I take AC, I turn it into DC, and then I make my own AC frequency to speed up and slow down an electric motor. And that's much more efficient than an induction type motor. An induction type motor is lucky to get 80% efficiency. Um, an inverter drive motor is more like 90 something percent efficiency. But the main benefit of it is that I can speed it up and slow it down. So rather than uh, paralysis by analysis, working out what I need for a specific space and saying I need this size air conditioner for this size space, doesn't matter, put in one that's a bit bigger than what you need. Ultimately, the inverter will slow that thing down. You get the amount of heat that you need, but that compressor has a, a finite life. It'll run for 15,000 hours, we know that. Um, we've run the thing flat out 15,000 hours. It's physically worn out. It can't make the gas pressures that it needs anymore. So if I put in a heat pump that's too big, I run it less, I run it at a slower speed, it'll physically last longer and therefore uh, I get better value out of it. In terms of heat pump hot water, um, again, we, I work for iStore, we manufacture heat pumps. Uh, that means that we buy a heat pump out of China and we put our sticker on the side of it and we wear the warranty liability. We've got two models, one's a 180 litres and the other is a 270. And when I started, the engineer told me that a 180 was suitable for four people and a 270 was suitable for six people. 
head office is in Perth. That's where the engineer lives. Unfortunately, Perth's seven degrees warmer than it is here in Melbourne, and their cold water temperature never gets any colder than 20 degrees. And when you bring that 180 litre heat pump into Victoria, it's only good for two people. Um, easy way of explaining it, I use the larger one because the numbers kind of line up with cost of water a bit better. If I take 270 litres of water at 60 degrees and I mix it with another 270 litres of water at 20 degrees, I get 540 litres of water in the middle at 40 degrees, which is what most people like to shower at. Women, a little bit hotter at 42. I lose a little bit in the pipe work. My tank is made up of 100 kilos of steel. That's at 60 degrees as well. So typically in summertime, I can deliver 540 litres of water in the shower. That's a shitload of hot water. Uh, to give you an idea of what that costs, it takes three hours to heat a tank of hot water and the unit uses around 1200 watts. So 3600 watts of energy input power to have 54 minutes in the shower under a 10 litre a minute shower head. That's a lot. Now, if I'm to buy that water from Melbourne Water, it costs about five bucks for, per thousand litres. So the 500 litres of water that I bought costs $2.50 and it costs me less than 20 cents to heat it. Let's think about that for a second. I water my lawn with hot water these days just because I can. It's so cheap to do it. Um, so it doesn't matter. Uh, in summertime, we've got an abundance of solar energy that's falling on our roof. Wintertime, it's a lot harder. Instead of having 270 litres of water to mix at 20 degrees, now I've only got 135 litres of water at 10 degrees. So my deliverable water is now only 400 litres. Now the Australian standard requires that I can't turn the heat pump on until it gets down to 49 degrees which means that I've got 20% less energy there as again, and now I'm into the 300 litre category, and all of a sudden I put two teenagers in the shower and I've run out of water. Doesn't matter, heat pumps are really cheap, and it's the way that we're gonna decarbonise Australia rapidly, uh, and getting off gas is critically important because no one's got a gas well in their backyard and everyone wants to make money out of selling you energy. So get the biggest PV system that you can, ditch gas, get some air conditioners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I know why is it so difficult to stop you when you start talking. <laughs> okay. All right, so we will start our panel uh, discussion session now. So and then once we have a few questions to the panel, we will open it for the audience for your questions. So my, my first question is to our first speaker, Maida. Um, it's very interesting uh, to see the, the details of the new NCC seven star um, rates, seven star standards. And unfortunately, as we all know, Victoria has decided to delay the implementation. Whereas many people have been waiting for years and years for the new NCC 2022 complaining that we are far, we are not even far behind in uh, some, some of the countries uh, like Europe and the UK and others, some of the United States. Uh, states. So, and it is, my is seven star, you know, is it difficult or I can't, can we go better than seven, seven star? Well, um, I think um, seven seven stars is um, I mean, as 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 in terms of specification in the building code, um, as specified, I don't think it's difficult. I think the issue is is, it, is there a construction industry or trades people, for example, in it's actually in the actual build that um, that could be um, an issue. Um, for example, um, thermal breaks. Just ensuring that there's thermal breaks in 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 how you put together your your external walls. Um, more often than not, um, these are over, you know, basically not not checked during the build. So at the end of the day, your tradespeople would actually just put it up. And um, and um, this, for example, in in terms of residential construction in in, in Australia, there's three popular um, materials for the building envelope. It's precast, timber, and then um, um, steel studs, steel framework. But 
SEALS framework is popular because it's easy for trans people to actually put it, put it together. I mean, consist, consistent dimensions. Timber is expensive. Um, timber, particularly during co um, after COVID, I think I heard from suppliers basically it increased 125%. Now this is going to be a bit of an issue in terms of the cost of timber. So but seven stars in terms of specifying according to the building code compliance, um, we could do more, I think, but at the moment, the, the policy basically just ensures that it's seven stars. But um, I think the issue that we need to look at is um, the implementation and the construction. Because if that's that's covered, then you'd have basically a good building fabric performance or building thermal performance for the building. It's quite uh, stunned to find that a lot of Australia's sawn timber comes from the Ukraine. That, that's my love. I mean, it's interesting, like, you know, we rely on the uh, software to uh, decide our house, you know, the, the, the buildings are seven star or eight star, but whereas in actual practice, a seven star design house could be a three or four stars. And it, it all depends on how the trades are actually putting uh, things together. So there could be, you know, uh, holes in between the insulation course in between you know where you install your lighting but nobody's actually doing a, a check after the construction and even you know commissioning to make sure that what is actually designed is being fixed so nobody's responsible for providing you know the, the build quality that is the if even though we have standards but we are not really implementing and making sure the standards are being um, you know, assured. But my next question <laughs> Um, I would like to add that the standards are just appallingly bad in Australia. I speak internationally a lot and I very often tell the audience I'm absolutely ashamed what we do in Australia with the watts per square meter. You need to talk and forget about the star rating system because that's so rigged and that's only making things worse. If we start to do the basics like building services and teaching, and he said also, Watts per square meter is the core thing that we need to calculate back to, and the watts per person that we use. That's a uniform global thing. We are the worst in the world. The even, worst. Even the watts per square meter and, the, and that neighbor's rating uh, has a problem in that it doesn't account for me that wants a 45 square house or a 50 square house um, versus a 25 square house. Um, I did this. The run around the volume builders to talk to them about heat pumps. And amazingly, uh, I said to the guys at Arden Homes in particular, you haven't got any small houses here at all. What, what's the average size house? They said, the average size house that we're building now is 45 squares. But they're absolutely enormous. I have one myself, um, and it's, a, it's an absolute palace. I wouldn't have built it, um, something that might partner believes is something that she needed. Turns out when you've got teenage kids and you think that this is going to be your last large house and that they're going to move out and you'll be able to sell out and downsize, that doesn't work. They end up getting boyfriends and they move into the house with you. So we are becoming a multi-generational um, uh, nation, i.e. our kids can't afford to move out for a long, long time. And I think that does actually have a bit of an impact here as well, that it hasn't done before. When I was 18, I moved out. And my mum basically threw all of us out of the house at 18 and told us to go and do our own thing. Um, whereas these days, we're a, a little bit more considerate of our kids that, that just can't afford it. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question to Andrea and Jeff. Uh, so, Andrew, it was very interesting to see the, the burden of disease, you know, for these uh, low in social housing cohorts. And traditionally in, in Melbourne and in Australia, the, the focus has been all about the heated season. And that's basically the reason the subsidized provided. But with climate change and more and more extreme weather, like what we have mentioned in this slide, um, uh, how, how is the policy looking into you know the overheating and um, what kind of support 
uh, we could provide um, um, in a from a research perspective for people who are um, and Felipe, your research showed that heating is and, and traditionally maybe uh, for cold heating season probably you know you can it's easy to adapt maybe with clothing or other things but for overheating that's something maybe difficult because people are not used to the, the heat in, in this uh, mm. uh, which we are anticipating in the next few decades. Any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, can you hear? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, it is a trick question because uh, um, in my in my research, I found that um, yeah, there is no issue with heat uh, with um, uh, underheating because they have subsidized system. And some people ask me when I tell them is um, okay. So um, they are not paying the heating and. What I found is that they usually have the heating at full power with the windows open in winter. So it's like um, even there is a waste of energy in those places and the performance is really steady. Like in winter, even if it's really cold or hot, it's like 22, 23 degrees steady for what I measured. Um, so some people ask me like, that means that they should start paying to be more conscious about the energy that they are wasting. But at the same time, in summer, because they don't have any subsidized system, they are completely overheated and all the units are overheated and they're complaining about that. So that is, is an issue because if you make them start paying more for the heating to be more conscious about it, they probably wouldn't use it because they don't use, even if they have some cooling portable air conditioning, they are not using it because it's too expensive for them. So then you would have more people being sick and, and probably too cold in the units because they have to pay. So I, I don't know what's the answer on that, like what's the ideal way to approach it. But I think if you're looking about health and well-being for those people, probably keeping the subsidized system for heating is the way to go. And we should start looking at ways of the, to reduce overheating in summer. I don't know if it's just a subsidized system. I think the government is planned to apply air conditioning, install air conditioning in different um, social houses. Uh, I don't know if they have done it or they are going to do it in the high-rise building. I think it's the only low-rise buildings. Um, but the issue is that, um, fr from my research, is that I a, a lot of papers <laughs> mentioned that that relying on air conditioning also makes them um, less adaptable. So when we had, I think it was 2017 or 16 that we had the, the blackout because of uh, doing the heat waves. And the issue is that if you are relying on air conditioning to have lower temperatures, then if the power is off, then you are not going to be able to adapt, to adapt and probably more issues are going to be coming from relying on air conditioning. So I don't know, like there's not like a true answer for that. Um, I think passive ways to reduce overheating is probably the way to go. So I think my research could help a lot about that in, in terms of ideal windows for ventilation. But during heat waves, then then it would be an issue, I think. Uh, I don't know what you think, Andrea, about it. <laughs> um, yes, well, high rise has different heating systems, yeah. which includes not necessarily having to pay your heating bill. But most social housing in Australia is detached housing. So people are and have to pay their bills. But of course, there's the health burden, but there's also the financial burden. I mean, public housing tenants, social housing tenants also have a huge amount of fuel poverty. It's, it's a very traditional problem um, within Australia and in other places like, like the UK. The, the huge opportunity that exists in having a very aged system is the opportunity to renew that housing and make it as passive as possible. So very little heating is actually required. And those issues such as, you know, the quality of air versus the temperature. Yeah. I mean, we have technology that can, yeah. can deal with that. Sure. But it's all about having a housing system. You've got to have a housing system which says we will put sufficient capital into this system so this mm. renewal can take place in a planned way. Uh, and I was just saying to you earlier about the, the, the problem with using um, capital into the social housing system as economic stimulus is the government says 
here's $100 million, give me, well, actually, here's $500 million, give me 30,000 houses, but I want them yesterday. So what <laughs> those organisations do is they go flat out to get any house as quickly as possible. So housing, you get the worst type of housing in the worst kind of locations. And that's a function of a lack of policy commitment to funding it as a system. And if we did fund it as a system, we would actually save money because at the moment we're paying huge maintenance bills on highly depreciated stock. If you keep recycling your assets, renewing those assets, you do that to get a metric at which the maintenance costs are going to be low throughout the life of that housing. So it, like most six to housing in Australia, it's mm -hmm. a lack of proper policy framing. Welcome down. Start again. Start again. A lot of them, you just knock them down. <laughs> and also, you, you and um, Andrea, you were talking in your, in your presentation about um, renovations. And what I found is, like, in the high-rise building, at least, they have renovated, the, I think, probably 20 years or more, they renovated the windows. But if, if you look at many of those buildings, like from level six upwards, they have been renovated. From level six downwards, they haven't. It, it looks like the, the the government was like like getting this budget to change the window and they ran out of money and they stopped and then half of the apartment units have a new type of windows. The other one has the old ones. And also the other renovations they had were including some thermal insulation. But one of the buildings, for instance, at, at Albert Park, the ones that I was measuring, is for elderly people and don't have insulation at all. So it's like they pick some of the apartment units, they included some renovations, okay, insulation, but the other ones don't have any insulation. And actually it's the one that is performing the worst in winter and in summer, uh, wasting a lot of energy during during winter. And don't even know that. That's probably not even in their own records. Yeah, the yeah. asset management systems, particularly in the social housing sector, I think Victoria is probably quite, not very good. Um, you know, they don't record. They don't, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the data systems to do really efficient management. Like, you know, they couldn't tell you which, which places have got uh, disability access, for example. Really basic levels of data is required to work out what is the optimum thing to do, but they don't have it. Okay, um, one last question to the panel and this is to you, Carl. Um, so we, we, we always talk about you know, the different levels of the trophy thing, sometimes the, the refurb, or the trophy, depending on it, you can. It's very easy to put insulation on the ceiling and very easy to put, you know, uh, window curtains. But to do uh, wall the trophy and even floor the trophy, it's really difficult. You have to knock out on some of those things. So, how, how does the heat pumps, I mean, the efficiency of heat pumps, how does it Yeah, work? I can answer this. So, uh, again, this is covered in soil reference book uh, for rapid decarbonisation. Uh, we can have this uh, paralysis by analysis and say that we need to reduce uh, this 30% of the heat that's going out of the building through the walls. And we can map that out probably several, eight, 10 kilowatt hours a day with energy going in and out of the building through those walls. And if we put in a heat pump to provide heating and cooling for temperature, uh, aren't within keeping of the, the comfortable living of those people in the house, then so be it. It's a, a cost of a couple of kilowatt hours, which we can easily provide from solar. Uh, and therefore, doing things like wall retrofits isn't cost effective for the occupants of the house, even though it would be ideal. Um, this runs in my family. I'm not the only one. Uh, so all of my sisters have all electric homes. We've all got electric cars now. My mum's got 150,000 bucks worth of retrofitted double facing in the house in Van Iris. That's all UPVC. Uh, that's fantastic. She can't do anything about the double brick construction of the house because there's nothing that you can do. Uh, in terms of the other stuff, she's still got hydronic heating. We we'll get there one day. At the moment, hydronic heating with reverse cycle air conditioning only, uh, or reverse cycle heat pumps doesn't. Uh, market just isn't big enough for them. We've got maybe 100,000 homes in Victoria that have got hydronic heating, and therefore it's very difficult for anyone to come to market and have a, a, a one-size-fits-all solution like there is for hot water. 
commence uh, that one's a twenty thousand dollar exercise. But the easy answer is for those people, get get the biggest gain in the areas of the house that you're going to use. So um, if we can't do the perfect solution, then the right solution is we can't afford to do the whole house right now. We'll do the main kitchen, living, dining area with some kind of an air conditioner. We need to run the gas heater to top up the heat in the rest of the house and circulate the heat that we've already got in that room. Great, do that. Um, we, we still have a scenario where 30, 40% of Victorian homes have got air conditioners now, and yet they don't use them for heat because someone's told them that it's less, uh, less gas, which it's not. Uh, so that one's just a simple public education thing. But I do really recommend that everyone goes out and grabs that book from Amazon. It's 22 bucks and get delivered to your door. You can watch numerous YouTube videos that he's done with people who ask him that comment. But the, the, the kicker was we really are in the luckiest country in the world. We've got an abundance of energy that falls onto our roofs. Um, and if we do have some compromises in buildings that are uh, uh, cost prohibitive to fix, don't worry about it, move on. Uh, eight pumps are close enough and we can make a big difference. Thank you, Edward. Um, if there's some questions from the audience, yeah. Thank you. My question is to Andrea. I, if I understood correctly, you were implying that the poor quality of social housing is the cause of uh, their ill health. How do we know that the correlation is not the other way around? That it is the poor health of people which is causing them to live in social housing? Sorry, because I'm a little bit hard of hearing. Can you, can you say that again? I'll, I'll repeat for you. Yeah. Um, is there a correlation between the poor health of the people in the social housing and the housing, and the housing itself? Or is it just that we ended up in social housing because of our poor health? Uh, look, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, it, there's, there's you know, hundreds of thousands of people in it. So I think this is got to be. Um, poor, poor people end up in social housing. That, that's, you know, they, they come to it with a health burden because the system is rationed for those with the highest and most complex needs. So you get lots of people with disability and chronic health issues that, that go into it. But there is also no doubt that lots of social housing make people very sick. Um, the, a really big issue would be mould, for example. Lot, you know, the, 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 the housing that was built out of all concrete, those houses are notorious. So then there's the housing that's just really hard to heat. Even the quite modern stuff, you know, um, I remember a woman coming to me talking about, well, the house is nice, but it's open plan. I can't, I can't keep my heat in. I can't quarantine the heat so that we're warm. I've got a chronic illness, but I can't afford to heat the house. So of course she's she's more ill because she lacks the heat. So I think it's both things. Thanks. Uh, great panel discussion. Really exciting. A uh, couple things. Uh, first, I was interested in your perspective, like what would be the main question or challenge that you would call that and say first is prioritize you mentioned a few of them. And then do you see any collaboration opportunity between the residential um, space and the commercial property sector? Any any collaboration there? Uh, I was I'm happy for anybody. It's not so specific. Yeah. So um, I think in terms of collaboration between in the, um, residential sector and commercial sector, is that what you're referring to? Um, it could be in the class two um, categories of building. So for example, our, our apartment buildings. So more often than that, these apartment buildings or the multi-residential units would be essentially classified in commercial. So um, in terms of um, the building code, it's actually in volume one. So which is a uh, class two, of course, so two to nine. So I think in terms of, of collaboration with them, and I think developers generally for multi-res apartment blocks um, tend to be much more um, um, aware in terms of the performance of, 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 their, of their buildings following, of course, the, 
um, the NCC provisions. I mean, even previous to NCC provisions, 2020 to 2019 as well. But, um, and another thing I think um, in terms of, of looking at sort of um, um, the synergy or of how they work, we also have the apartment design guide, the better apartment design design guides, both um, in New South Wales and in Victoria. So New South, New South Wales got it first, so we there set 65 and then 2017 we have it in Victoria, but these are essentially just the planning, um, planning the layout, for example, in terms of making it more livable. And there could be a um, sort of um, a good way of, of looking at how they So essentially for commercial, for residential, it would have to be in, a, um, in depending on the category of, of the building, so just class two or class three. Hi, uh, right. I'd like to speak to you all individually as well. I've got a project on called Renovation Pathways. We've mapped Australia's existing building stock for residential across Australia. Um, and really, this isn't a question, but a comment about how energy demand uh, is built into the research as well. We've got really low levels of building literacy across uh, households and how occupants keep themselves hot in uh, winter, cold in summer. Um, and it's great that we've got this electrification, but what about the thermal shell? Because that's the one aspect where you can start to shift demand for energy away from those peak times when solar generation is at its lowest. And if we don't focus on the, the reduction and we just focus on the technology, then we're not really going to reduce the energy demand down. So we can't have this, the lowest cost energy transition towards a renewable energy grid. So it's really around how energy demand fits in thermal shell into each of these projects. Fantastic projects, by the way. Um, I would like to highlight that as well. I have um, a history in the Netherlands retrofitting the most hated building, the tax office in the city of Rotterdam, to the most loved building. Um, uh, and, and I became quite famous. I fled to Australia. Um, don't want to be famous anymore. Um, but the, the, the building services um, technologies is exactly the same. We need to do exactly what you mentioned. Just go to the lowest watts per square meter. And then are the Swiss and the Danish. And just ignore all that uh, diversion that the Americans keep throwing on us and banned these ducted systems that Sweden banned already in 1974. When we had an oil crisis in Western Europe, they banned them because they're inefficient and they make people very uncomfortable and sick. That is directly related, and my professor, Professor Van Brunswijk at Technical University Eindhoven taught me that, those ducted systems make people sick because they're a biohazard. And that still is a reason why I get banned off IRA platforms. IRA is basically the cartel that runs our energy provisions systems in Australia. We need to address that huge, huge problem to get the energy costs down, but also get the uh, medical costs down. That's what I wanted to add. If I may on that one, just quickly, the, the reason why we have ducted air conditioning systems being installed in new homes is because builders make money on margin. And when you buy a house, uh, if you want to live in that house, you're going to be freezing to death in the dark. Uh, the standard house has very few lights, very few power points, lucky to get one in each room, and it doesn't have any heating and cooling. So you go in to see the volume builder, and he says you can have the big ranch for $299,000. It's got no heating. Uh, so then the, the customer says, all right, well, what's the cheapest he heating option? It's gas. Um, a gas home uh, heating unit costs 3,000 bucks, and then we put the ducts in the house. Uh, the ducts are worth another 1,000 bucks and another 2,000 bucks to install it. So the whole thing's worth six grand, and yet the builder charges 10. Uh, there's good margin in that business. There is a good margin in installing um, I'd like to add to that. I work in Pakistan and in China, yep. where we have a massive problem that all the people from Pakistan and China want to come and live here. They all think it's great, but now we have 
successfully implemented all these technologies from Denmark and from Switzerland in these massive projects, thousands and thousands of homes in Pakistan, are now becoming a magnet for talent because we ignored all that bullshit of builders that are used to build as usual. We ignored it. And I've been treated like God when I go to China. I get treated like absolute God. Oh, everyone does. China's magnificent. We all love going to China. No, but they, it's great. The, the, the highest boss studied here at RMT. I, I spent a couple of weeks in China visiting solar panel uh, manufacturing facilities for a company called Sun Edison. And not only was the, the, uh, the hospitality absolutely stunning and amazing, but I spent a month being depressed when I came back to Australia that I'm living in a third world country. Okay, we have one more couple questions. Two, two more questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my question is to Andrea around uh, financing energy efficiency and retrofitting in social housing. Now, given we talked about how knee jerk the public financing for social housing stock is in Australia, and at the same time, the rental model of social housing doesn't give them so much space to invest in profiting their stock. Are there some new opportunities outside of the traditional models of financing social housing that can be leveraged to drive this agenda towards sustainability of the stock? Sorry, it's because my hearing was enough financing what the model should be, could be. Yeah, so you, there are two key problems that I mentioned, that financing for public sources are pretty limited and uh, irregular. Find the rental model that social housing providers also use does not give them the space to invest in the stock. So are there new or alternative models of financing that social housing providers can use to drive or improve their stock? Um, in other countries, they actually, the, they have uh, like, say in the UK, used, used to have, um, a housing benefit. So essentially, in some countries, the central government add a subsidy stream in there so that the provider gets enough revenue to cover operating and capital costs. Australia is one of a handful of countries where we have this very ridiculous idea that somehow you don't subsidise subsidised housing. It is subsidised housing. That's ha you have to have a subsidy in there. But we're, uh, you know, we've had decades of public policy that's really tried to move us away from social housing and cre increase the reliance on private rental housing, which is now a, nearly a third of all housing. And we might talk about how bad social housing standards are. Much of the private housing is even worse. Um, but there's a lot of Commonwealth rent assistance going in there, but it's not effectively used either without general standards, habitation standards of a certain quality. I mean, all low-income people are facing very poor conditions in Australia. So, so the central thing is just a basic issue. Governments must fund it. I'll give you you can do it different ways, but they must fund the gap. I'll give you an easy example there. Obviously, I'm in a business where we sell popular heat pumps. Some of the simple fails are then a couple, then a couple that cost five bucks. Um, a fan motor costs twenty-five dollars. A capacitor costs twenty-five dollars. By the time the customer rings up, I diagnose it over the phone. I send a staff here or a plumber out there to swap out the part. It's a five hundred dollar exercise to change a twenty-five dollar part. And people just say, oh, I can't believe it. So we we'll look around. That's what it costs to do stuff in, uh, in Australia. Labor is insanely expensive, and it's doing anything in public housing where there's a, a, a fixed budget and this is what you've got to do the job for. It's very difficult to get anything done. Okay, final question. Hi, uh, my question is, uh, in the current market, the prices for gas, I feel is uh, much cheaper than the prices for electricity. Uh, and I think the privatization of these uh, supplies is uh, one of the main reasons. So do, do you have an opinion on that? Uh, I can answer that one too. Uh, there's 3.6 megajoules for every kilowatt hour, right? So 3.6 times current going rates, 5 cents a megajoule, less 20% discount if you pay on time. 
So let's call it four cents a megajoule times 3.6. Uh, that's 16 cents a kilowatt hour equivalent. So given that a heat pump's using five times less energy, uh, electricity would need to be five times 16 cents, it would need to be 80 cents a kilowatt hour for the electricity um, to be line ball with the cost of gas. Um, Victoria has a gas shortage problem. Uh, ultimately, we've been getting gas out of Bass Strait now for 50 years. Uh, that comes is coming to an end now. So in the middle of 2025, there isn't enough gas for everybody. And people throw their arms up in the air and they say, that's outrageous. Australia exports shit tons of gas. And yes, I agree we do. Um, it all goes off the Northwest shelf. They bring it onshore, they burn it, they use it to generate electricity, to compress it, to cool it down, to liquefy it. All of that plant equipment costs nothing, of course, but Australians shouldn't have to pay for that. And then we would have put it in a ship and transport it from West Australia to Victoria. That ship's free. It didn't cost a billion dollars to build it, and it's not the size of four football fields. Um, it didn't cost nothing to drive it around the other side of Australia. And then once we get it here, for us to put that LNG into our gas network, it's a gas network, it's not an LNG network. We need to boil that liquid back off into a gas. And as the Germans found out, that's a billion dollars worth of plant and equipment. We wanted to do that in Western Port Bay, got knocked back on environmental grounds. We wanted to do it in Geelong for the gas renewable hub. And the previous government wanted a gas fired renewable so that they could pay their mates to put in a billion dollars worth of infrastructure and everybody could get rich. And ultimately, if you take that gas onshore, You've got $30 billion worth of plant equipment on the ground in Western Australia to liquefy that gas, and then you shift it to Victoria in a billion dollar ship, and you put it into a billion dollar facility. It doesn't cost four cents a megajoule anymore, it costs a shitload more than that. And this is why there's a get off gas campaign, because you've got a whole pile of plumbers and otherwise people that love gas wanting to line their pockets with your money. The reason why the current government has said no more gas in new housing is because this is a train coming to the end of the track and it's going to be a huge crash because the alternative is basically going to be bottled gas from somewhere else and that's spectacularly expensive in comparison with four cents a negative. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I think we can continue the conversation um, outside the lunch and once again, can we put our hands together for the speakers.